BCFM 93.2, your interactive station, 24 hours a day. Now, the refugee crisis, human cargo. Uh, tonight, we're joined in the studio by journalist and author Alex Perry, whose book, The Rift, A New Africa Breaks Free, has just been published. Hi, Alex, and welcome to The Politics Show. Thanks for having me. Uh, tell us uh, what inspired you to uh, uh, get into this subject and why you wrote the book, Alex. Uh, I, I guess, well, I was in, uh, I was posted to Africa. I was Africa bureau chief for Time magazine, and I was there for the best part of a decade. Um, but the reason I wrote the book was, was almost from the moment I got to Africa, it became clear that our perceptions of Africa were, were way off, basically. Um, and I, you know, turning to tonight's topic, the migrant crisis, you see the same thing happening there. I mean, it's, 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 African migrants are generally described as economic migrants, therefore uh, bad migrants. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take people running from a war, refugees from Syria or Afghanistan, but anyone coming uh, to better themselves is, is kind of seen as, you know, having greed as a motive and therefore, therefore bad, therefore a bad migrant. I mean, th there's so many sort of misconceptions in that that, you know, it, it, it kind of illustrates why I wrote the book. I mean, first of all, the cost of coming here um, is five to ten thousand dollars to take a passage with people smugglers across the Sahara and uh, on a leaky boat across the, uh, across the Med. So these are not, you know, that's quite a lot of money. So the idea that these are sort of destitute Africans looking to come to to somehow, I don't know, get into the welfare system or or take sort of low paid menial jobs is is very often wrong. Um, Ten thousand dollars is generally means that the people waiting around in detention centres in Sicily and so on are kind of middle class guys with degrees, you know. And uh, imagine the kind of the grit and the determination it takes to cross the Sahara and then the Mediterranean. Though these are self starters, these are these are people with a plan. They're actually exactly the kind of migrants that you want to come to your country. They're going to start something. They're going to create something. You know, they will be a benefit. Um, and if you look at a place like Northern Europe, where the population is aging and running out of young workers and young managers, these are, you know, any economist will tell you, these are the guys that you want. Well, hang on a minute, because most of the countries in Europe, maybe Germany accepted, are in totally the opposite situation, Alex, aren't they? They've got lots of unemployed. I mean, look at, for example, Spain and Italy. They're completely the opposite, where they're, they're, they're actually struggling to house and employ most of the people in their own country. Well, the migrants aren't stopping in Southern Europe. They're not going to the places where there aren't great economic prospects. They're looking, you know, they're smart. They read ahead, you know. You know, the, the other, it's only just dawned on the UK, for instance, that almost none of them are coming here. They're almost all going to Germany because Germany has a, has a very efficient processing system. You know, Germany's going to take, what, close to a million people this year. Do you think there's been a deliberate attempt to uh, confect the two between... There is quite obviously a lot of people have uh, been released from refugee camps in Turkey, uh, and these, these people are uh, coming in, in a completely different point of view, really. They're, they're, most of them are, are trying to escape a massive civil war, which has devastated their country. And, and uh, isn't there been, a potentially anyway, a deliberate attempt to conflate uh, people who are coming deliberately to try and get work in Northern Europe uh, to better themselves and their families with those who are fleeing death? Well, no, I mean, I think you see a real division. I mean, certainly from the, the politicians, you know, the politicians will say, well, we, you know, the, the guys coming from, you know, fleeing war uh, and devastation, those are the ones we'll accept. Actually, they legally have to accept those ones. They're not allowed to refuse them anyway. Well, but what about when they put a giant great wall up, uh, which is actually physically stopping them getting into the country? That's refusing them, isn't it? Well, yeah, and that's, I think that's basically illegal as far as I understand it. So you, you'd be perfectly within your legal rights to get a giant great pair of bolt cutters and chop your way through. Well, if, I, I think under the convention, you know, UN Convention of Human Rights, if someone arrives in your country uh, destitute, having fled, uh, you know, a place where their life is in danger, I think you are, I, th I think I'm right in saying under international law that you're legally bound to accept them, you know, that, that, that they have a legal right to apply for asylum in your country. Uh, Katie Hope from Bristol Refugee Rights, uh, is that right? Hi, yeah, hi. Um, actually, well, it's the UN Convention on right. Refugees, 1951 Convention. You have to prove that you individually have been persecuted, so it's not just a blanket statement for anyone fleeing a war. You've got to prove that you individually um, have been targeted as because of so your I mean, race, religion, 
membership of a particular social group. But what if, say, the house next door to you has just blown up and been yeah. blown up and you feel, well, maybe I'm going to be next, so i better get out of here? Well, certainly in developing countries, there's a kind of understanding that there's a de facto refugee status. If a huge number of people cross a border because they're being blown up, then you take it on face value that those people cannot return. And the key issue about being a refugee is that you've been forced to cross an international border. Your government will no longer protect you and therefore you are, you're, you're in need of international protection. So, What are your thoughts about the same question I ask Alex, about this uh, attempt to conflate the two? The, the, the migrants, economic migrants, so there clearly mm. are some, and, refugee, and refugees from, uh, you know, people who are quite within their rights to claim asylum because they've had to flee uh, the possibility of death. I think it sort of comes down to sort of slightly lazy journalism, really. It's just not really bothering to look into the reasons why people flee. And there's lots of reasons for forced displacement that don't quite live up to that very very high standard of the international convention of to be a refugee there's still people who are migrants who have protection needs for example i'm sure you must have come across those mm. in africa you know huge numbers of people who might not individually face persecution or you know have have that as the basis for their their reason to flee but they still have really huge humanitarian needs um, and lots of countries are a bit better i mean we, we do do this in the uk but lots of the european countries have a whole system of protection for those people which is called humanitarian protection it's not full refugee status but it's not it's recognizing they're not economic migrants they actually have some sort of you know protection needs uh, Alex, go, let's go back to uh, what you were saying about people coming uh, particularly to get work, get jobs, start a new life mm. um, for economic reasons. What are the reasons in Africa that they do that? I mean, is it fair to say that they're just trying to get a bigger house, a bigger car, that sort of thing? It's, it tends to be a sort of medium term plan I mean from the guys that I've, I've spoken to who make the journey from Africa and from the guys that I I've met I suppose I'm saying why now? Road. Why not 10 years ago? Why not 15 years ago? Well funny enough I mean kind of slightly paradoxically it's because Africa's getting richer and because they're getting richer <laughs> you can afford that passage like before there was just no possibility of even leaving the village now you've 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 been able to to well first of all stay at school till you're 18 or possibly even go for universities so you're better educated you've got ambitions you've got ideas you know about bill gates you've heard about you know different industries you, you, you maybe you read it on social media right but, but it's become a possibility to you now that it yeah. wouldn't have done if you'd left school you know after four years or something I like mean, that is it as simple as saying well somebody's going to provide that service to get me there where i don't need a visa i don't need to go through all the uh, you know the usual things i would have well, to do to get gain legal entry to a country well okay think of the flip side i mean for me right I'm a, I'm a foreign correspondent i travel to all these countries legally and for about a tenth of the price you know so it's 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 simply, you know, that's the only method available. Can't get a visa, can't get on a flight without a visa, therefore have to go through the illegal channels. You know, I mean, so, so you know, I guess what's impressive to me is, is that people will still pay all that money to, to come, you know. And as I say, it's, it's, it's paradoxically, it's, it's a function of Af Africa getting richer. And, and the plan is generally not to stay here forever. It's almost always to improve your improve your standing back home so you work for maybe five or ten years most of the money seems to be directed towards building a house and and then you arrive back home triumphantly after having you know made your fortune in the, in a far off land and you marry the best girl in the village that that's generally sort of the plan and it tends to be and it, it, it tends to be the second son the first son stays there runs the family he's the head of the family it tends to be the second son that is it's a it's a kind of family council that goes right you go and see what happens now is it a question that over maybe the last 10 years or so this has started to happen more people have actually come back uh built houses got that status and that has almost been like a big advert to go and try and oh i'm make sure your that's fortune the case. up in northern europe yeah i'm sure that's the case and then and then you know it's also you know the idea is that if you come in and you get a european wage well, that'll go a lot further. So it's, it's a kind of accelerator. You know, if you work for five years and, and, and save a fair amount, you go back to Ghana or wherever. You know, that'll buy a lot. It's almost like you it, come back like a millionaire kind of thing. Well, it'll probably be enough to, you know, as I say, build a house and maybe start a business, you know, maybe have a couple of cars, that kind of stuff. So it's, yeah, it's an accelerator. But 
No, I don't see that many people. I, I mean, refugees are very different. That you know, particularly you know, the, the influx you see from Syria now seems to be, you know, millions of people who have given up the idea of ever going home. You know, they've been four years in camps and they're they're saying, you know, it's gone, it's gone. We have to move on. Whereas, whereas, funnily enough, actually things have been turning around there. I just wonder if you've got any comments about what's been happening over the last week or so uh, with, uh, you know, actually two weeks now, isn't it? The Russians have been um, uh, bombing and sending cruise missiles in to apparently take out ISIS and other Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra front. It may even be that the end of the civil war in Syria is in sight now the Russians have intervened. What, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I mean, I, you know... My, my my thoughts are probably the same as anybody else but in terms of, you know, I don't have any sort of direct reporting on the ground there and, and so few do now. I mean, so much of Syria is essentially an information black hole to so many of us. But, it, yeah, from what I read, it does seem that the Russians are not going to let Assad fall and that in some way, you know, that may build some stability around Damascus. But the reasons the Russians went in was because it seemed like Damascus might fall. So I, I don't think it's in any way stable in Syria right now. Yeah, and it's not going to be time to go back. Uh, back, back to you, Katie. Um, I, I, I mean, actually, maybe I should just finish by, by pinning you down, Alex, on this business. Do you think there's been an attempt to conflate refugees with these migrants you're talking about? No, no. what I see actually is almost exactly the opposite, is, is that, you know, the, 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 you know, what David Cameron would call the swarm oh. is, <laughs> you know, is... Well, OK... People come, people come together. You know, if you're coming from somewhere like Libya, you know, it's it's a real mix of people from from who originate in different places, different nationalities, different ages, even sometimes a lot of unaccompanied children, and they arrive conflated. But what you see is a very deliberate effort to say, okay, you, you, you are deserving because you're being persecuted, but you, 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 you just want to get richer, so so out. And and I think that's um, well, it's economically illiterate. You know, migration is fantastic for the economy, and any economist will tell you that. Look at all the richest countries in the world. They have high, high migration. Well, the, the economists might tell you, but unemployed people here won't, will they? Well, it's... It, OK, the evidence that migrants displace unemployed people from work is just not there. It's just not there. Theresa May, actually, her own department put out, uh, uh, you know, figures last year saying that was the case. You know, her, her speech this week was... W was was kind of factually unfounded, you know. But if you know, look at if you want to be isolated, if you want no migration, you're saying we want to be North Korea, we want to be Eritrea, you know, static stasis and and really quite poor. Um, Katie, I wonder what your uh, reaction was to Theresa May's speech this week. I know the city actually I was quite surprised to see many big business organisations right across the country pretty much roundly condemning what she'd said um, and. She's setting out her stall to be the leader. We know, actually, Boris is going to almost certainly be the leader. It does seem like she's shot herself in the foot. Yeah, I really hope she has. It was just the most <laughs> horrific bit of speech I've ever heard. But what was really sad about it is that underpinning all those disgusting views is actually an immigration bill, which, with all this focus on what's happening with refugees in Europe, is sort of slipping a little bit unseen behind the... You know, behind the the walls of uh, Parliament. It's got its second reading next Tuesday, and certainly for those people fleeing war and persecution, like you were talking about, Alex, you know, it's it's going to be horrendous. We already treat asylum seekers very differently from any other needy person in the UK. They're already on half the levels of what people on income support would be on, and they've just cut the rates for families. So all of this rhetoric about supporting people only overseas that are in resettlement camps and taking the most vulnerable will actually just look at what we're about to do within the UK. Now you've, you've said that we're treating uh, as asylum seekers differently uh, to uh, other people in the in the UK who are claiming benefits. What about comparing how Britain uh, treats asylum seekers to other parts of the EU? Yeah well that's really important too and you know you'd, you if you looked at what the government was saying I think you'd think that we were taking enormous numbers in the UK. In actual fact, asylum seekers made up only 8% of those who came to the UK. 8%, it's absolutely tiny. You've also got to look at the, the inequality here as well. I mean, there are, I think there are, but basically you have the number of uh, people born outside the UK living in the UK are more or less balanced by the people from the UK living overseas. 
You know, I think the amount in the UK is 4.7 million. I think the amount of Brits working overseas, like me, is about 4 million. You know, so it's, it's kind of unfair to say it's fine for you to migrate and travel and work if you're from a rich country. But if you're from a poor country, you stay where you are. You know, there's, you know basically, we, in this age of globalisation, we seem to have globalised capital, but not, but not labour. Um, yeah, the what, what, are your, what are your thoughts about this uh, uh, immigration bill that's coming along, Alex? Because it's certainly, from what, what, what uh, Katie's saying, mm. it's going to make things more difficult for asylum seekers, actually. Well, I mean, I've, you know, the, the, the immigration debate in this country seems to be sort of heavily coloured by the idea that, you know, it, which essentially came out of the rise of UKIP, that there is a... A large, well, it's an idea in the politicians' minds, I think, that there is a large um, population out there that will be motivated by some sort of prejudice. But they are, they were actually UKIP, although they only got one MP, actually got quite a sizable slice of the vote in the general election. They did, they did. But did you also notice during the election campaign how many embarrassments UKIP had when, you know, candidate after candidate after member turned out to be racist? You know, uh, what a surprise that was. And, and what I'm seeing actually. In the, over the last couple of months, is a is a is a rapid growing sophistication in how this issue is is perceived and being treated, and I think actually you know politicians like Theresa May who think they're onto a vote winner here have sort of fallen behind the curve. There's there's you know people have a much more nuanced view of immigration than they did even six months ago. Okay, well let's have a listen now to a clip from Theresa May's speech earlier this week and see what you both make of it. At the moment, for example. Workers coming to the UK on very low salaries can claim over £10,000 on top of their salary in benefits, which makes the UK a hugely attractive destination. This is not good for us or for the countries those people are leaving. That is why the Prime Minister is right to target the amount we pay in benefits for those coming to the UK to work and put these arrangements on a sensible basis. So these are the main reasons why net migration is still too high. But the trouble is other changes mean that without the right policies it's going to get even harder to get the numbers down. Modern forms of communication, cheaper international travel and the increase in relative prosperity for many people in the developing world mean that large numbers of people are more mobile than ever before. And this is compounded by several other factors. For years, despite its many other flaws and its criminal leadership, Libya was known as Europe's forward border. British immigration office officials worked there with their European and Libyan counterparts to stop illegal immigration from Africa at its source. Now the criminal gangs that smuggle people into Europe have been able to work unimpeded. Free movement rules don't just mean European nationals have the right to reside in Britain. They now mean anybody who is married a European can come here almost without condition. And Schengen, the agreement that abolished borders between EU states apart from Britain and Ireland, means that once a migrant arrives in a country with weak border controls, like Greece, they can make their way across Europe and into Germany or up to the British border at Calais without checks. Many of those people will eventually get EU citizenship and the free movement rights that come with it. Even actions taken with the best of intentions have consequences. When the German government, motivated by compassion and decency, said they expected to receive 800,000 asylum seekers this year, it prompted hundreds of thousands of people to try to get to Germany. Some of these people were refugees, coming directly from Syria or the camps in Turkey, Jordan and Lebanon. But many, in fact up to half of them, were migrants from other parts of the world. So reducing and controlling immigration is getting harder. But that's no reason to give up. As our manifesto said, we must work to control immigration and put Britain first. Well, not quite as long a round of applause as David Cameron got when he had a go at Jeremy Corbyn, uh, but uh, what do you make of that? Some of the points there were quite just 
based on very little really why do we need less immigration but um, I suppose for me I'm I'm talking on behalf of Bristol Refugee Rights my key uh, point here is that is her demonising of asylum seekers who make their way to the UK there's some bizarre thing that she came up with in her speech that if you've managed to get to the UK um, you're somehow going to be a fit young man who is not deserving of protection but if you're taken from the camps uh, surrounding you know refugee conflicts that you're much more deserving um, the irony is that when it comes to the new immigration bill what Theresa May wants to do is take away support from families and make them destitute in country in cities like Bristol. So that's going to happen to the people that we have who come to our centre. Um, so if your claim for asylum is rejected, which uh, many are, um, they get the decision making wrong in 30% of cases. So 30% are overturned at appeal. All those people at the moment are entitled to some form of support. Um, if they can't return to the country of origin. When this immigration bill's passed, they won't be entitled to anything. So suddenly the local authority will have large numbers of families with children who under the Children Act cannot be left destitute to support. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase tension apart from anything else, apart from making people homeless and destitute. I mean, it's the obvious thing to do to, for these people if they're destitute just simply to start working for organised crime, and that's what normally happens in most parts of the, the developing world. Well, t certainly reports that charities have done into destitution meant that they are absolutely forced into some sort of organised crime, prostitution. You know, they, they are really the most vulnerable people, and they are exploited in the UK you know if they're left in that position so yes you're absolutely right G yeah. just give us a, a, um, a, a an idea of what bristol refugee rights actually does because you I mean you know maybe looking at a couple of cases without going into names uh, and the bulk of the, what you deal with during the year yeah that's great yeah thank you yeah so we've been around for nine years now we are a welcome center that's open three days a week wednesday thursday friday and we really offer that support both um, emotional support and practical support that will help people when they arrive in the country and when they're newly given refugee status as well um, we find people they turn up and um, we have people from all sorts of backgrounds a lot of we were talking about africa earlier a lot of people from africa from fleeing you know conflicts in various different countries and they come with nothing they're absolutely bewildered they've probably had a horrendous journey um, and Alex has written an interesting book about you know what happens during that journey of being smuggled across Europe um, they arrive in the UK and they have to go through the asylum process which is a really tough process you you know as I said before you're proving that you individually have been targeted it's not enough just to have fled in a generalized way um, and they sometimes wait for a long time for a decision. They often have their decisions turned down, at which point their support is under question. Um, and they're living, as I said before, on, on really low amounts of money, having bought nothing here and having no support networks here. But the key thing that we do in our centre is to try and address that isolation, the need to learn English, which is actually really hard now. You know, the same government that's trying to reduce the number of asylum seekers and is talking about not wanting too many migrants is actually making it more difficult to learn English. So we provide English classes and British life classes, which just explain some of the customs here with a crash. Um, we do work to help people with their cases, so around you know, getting that support that they need, finding a solicitor that's an effective solicitor and helping them with their case. And just simple things like a really warm, welcoming atmosphere where they can get a hot meal, which is often the only hot meal they get in the week, a haircut, a massage. It's just a really lovely place to come along and, and be. Um, it's very supportive to those people. But what do you say to those, um, in particularly unemployed people, people who've lost their jobs, who are applying for job after job after job, who point their finger at people who've come from other countries and saying, well, they're taking our jobs? Why does it have to be either or? I guess, you know, I would feel just as supportive towards someone who is unemployed in this country as I would do towards the people that we work with. I don't see why. Why do the poor people in this society have to be pitted against each other? You know, it's, there's plenty of wealth in this country to go around to support everyone who's in need. And I'm not saying, you know, that that's... that's that's the focus of my work. Well, I know my work is Certainly when it about comes to refugees. welfare, the government would disagree with you, wouldn't they? They'd say, actually, no, there isn't enough wealth to go around. Yeah, they would. Yeah, yeah, well... <laughs>
<laughs> okay, well maybe that's another not. that's another show, really. Uh, isn't it? Uh, Alex, uh, coming back to you, um, uh, what, c- tell us a little bit about who's making the money out of these um, other ways unofficial ways where you're not applying for a visa to get from Africa and right, other well, countries to, to Europe. That's the, you know, that's the great irony of, of Theresa May's speech. You know, here is the Home Secretary, the, the person who's in charge of law and order, and um, she's proposing a policy that essentially helps provide an opportunity worth billions of dollars for organised crime. You know, the, the African organised crime is making billions out of this, smuggling people across the Sahara and across the Mediterranean. Once they arrive in Europe, I was down in uh, Sicily earlier this year looking into the Italian mafia's uh, involvement in, in detention centres. Basically, they rigged the contracts to, to manage detention centres. Um, and they keep people there for as long as they can. You know, I was talking to a bunch of... There were some Ethiopian guys and Nigerian guys. They're supposed to be processed in six weeks. They've been there two years because the guys that run the centre are making 32 euros a head a day from 5,000 people in that centre. You know, that's hundreds of millions of dollars. And so, you, you know, you have this situation where the forces of law and order who are saying we can't let... Um, undesirables in are actually boosting undesirables at home. They're boosting organised crime. Um, also joined by uh, Kevin Boylan. Kevin, um, you've uh, done a little report for us, haven't you? Thank you very much. On this very strange phenomenon of, um, and there's been a little peppered through some of the press reports to do with what's been going on in the Mediterranean as people are crossing. Reports of uh, Marines, military, uh, actually appearing halfway across the, on the crossing. Uh, so, would you just like to tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, I was in Lesbos Island in the in August, late August, and while I was there, I um, interviewed a refugee uh, named Mohammed, and um, he told me about um, some attackers involved in clandestine maritime interceptions of of uh, of refugees, stroke migrants between Turkey and Greece and these are known colloquially as German commandos although Mohammed uh, made his crossing without incident luckily he did tell me that some of the Syrians in his dinghy had done so previously and were terrified that such an encounter would be repeated luckily they arrived on the north side of the island rather than than, um, than the than the south where um, where that, that would have happened um, he told me about a Facebook page in Arabic where references to the commandos may be found. Um, I don't have any Arabic, so um, I. Uh, but I have discovered that the Arabic characters used at, at the site uh, form an expression in, in Syrian or, or Palestinian dialect that means the centre or station, as in coach station, of those displaced who are having a difficult life. Uh, these commandos are dubbed German because they apparently speak either German or English when they uh, intercept the boats. Uh, many are reputedly blue-eyed. They are disciplined. They dress in black. Uh, balaclavas carry U.S. weaponry, um, M16s. They only operate at night with their usual practice being to disable a refugee boat search it for its occupants, uh, that means permanently disable the refugee boat, um, seizing all their possessions, passports, money, etc. The, the commandos then throw the mobiles into, that they find into the water to prevent the victims calling for help. Uh, men are beaten up and the commandos tow the boat back, boat back to the Turkish waters where the refugees are left to their fate. If they're lucky, they get picked up the next day by the Turkish p- Coast Guard, but If not, well, you can imagine. The waters between Turkey and Lesbos are patrolled uh, by regular vessels of the Turkish and Greek Coast Guards in addition to those of Frontex, this being the European Frontier Police. All three of these forces have been implicated in what's known as pushbacks uh, and other crimes against international law. Although it's clear that there are other more shadowy actors operating as well, including these commandos. Early on this year, the Greek Coast Guard was investigated internally in Greece for collaborating with unidentified civilian elements in 
pushbacks and robbery. But this has been allegedly stopped by the series since by the series uh, g- government. Um, there are also, in all likelihood, criminal pirate gangs familiar with the waters operating out of Turkey that may try to rob migrants. And these freelance or irregular elements add a certain amount of confusion to the to the story. Okay, Kevin, well, thanks very much for that. And uh, we'll post some links uh, to some of the articles that you used to source that report uh, on the show page. That's at thisweek.org.uk. Well, I'd better, I'd better ask you about that first, Alex. What do you think's going on here? Yeah, I mean, that's not something I've, I've heard about. Um, what I do know is that the, those that are trying to uh, police the boats coming over are, are completely overwhelmed. I mean, the, you know, for for every rescue there is, there are there are three or four that are unrescued, some of which sink. You know, and and, and if there is, I guess, if there's something that is, if you're going to try and judge the seriousness of these situations, I'd say you know, more than two thousand people drowning without any assistance or intent from anybody else at all would be. I mean, that's a humanitarian disaster in itself. But um. I guess I wouldn't be that surprised if there was a kind of a vigilante, a kind of local vigilante group um, d- trying to trying to send back migrants. I mean, you know, you get the same thing on land in almost every European country. The, it wouldn't be all that surprising to find a group being enterprising and doing it at sea. I don't know about M16s and all the rest of that, but you know, certainly. Wherever there's a there's a mass migration, it will produce um, you know resentment in a certain part of, a, of the receiving population. Tell us a little bit about this guy you mentioned in your Newsweek article. The last, I think it was the last edition, wasn't it, of Newsweek Europe? This went in just about under the wire um, <laughs> before uh, our, before the news wake. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I bet it was a good party anyway <laughs> when you closed down. But anyway, Emma Gemani, if I've pronounced it right, yeah. uh, seemed to be making quite a lot of money out of getting people across the Mediterranean. Fortune, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's making. Uh, uh, if you I mean you, one of those little rubber ducks, rubber dinghies, you know, you can get about two hundred fifty people. If, if they're all paying two thousand euros a head, something like that. I mean, you know, do the math. That's about what is that five hundred. 50,000 a boat, 80,000 boats, something like that. I mean, it's it's a lot. And this guy's sending 20, 30 boats a year, and he's been doing it for eight years, nine years now. So, yeah, th- there's a lot of money to be made here. I mean, th- th- the basic point, you know, going back to what I said earlier, you know, you ban any commodity or any service, you know, through human history, you provide a market for for criminals. You know, if the demand doesn't go away, look what happened to alcohol during Prohibition. This is the same dynamics at work here. There is a massive demand for travel to a richer part of the world. Now that we've banned it, we create this huge opportunity for criminals. Um, To wind up, because we're nearly at the 7 o'clock, coming up to the 7 o'clock news, Alex, uh, what would you like to see done from your experience? What what would help sort some of this out? Because, I mean, we cannot have a situation where organised crime is using, uh, making fantastic amounts of money here uh, and actually promoting this commodity of human cargo, many of which are simply dying in the process. I, I guess what I'd like is a kind of adult debate you know i don't want to see the kind of deceitful figures and um and and sort of rhetoric that you know theresa may came out with you know grow up and you know this is a serious situation where thousands of people are dying every year and grandstanding for your own political ambitions is you know i I find it pretty offensive you know please you know Take take cognizance of 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 the you know of there's, the there's families that are dying. Basic problem here, isn't there? That it's a bit unclear as to whose law it is in the Mediterranean. It seems it's nobody's law or the law of organised crime. Oh no, I think I think that's fair enough. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, open seas. You know, who's 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 in charge? But as Home Secretary in particular, you know, th- there there is there's action that she can take here. You know, she's in the she's in the seat, and 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 so to be using the situation to you know, mess around with migration figures, the things that she was saying about net migration, she knows she's fiddling those figures. There are hundreds of, you know, over 100,000 students in those figures who are here on a temporary visa. You know, she's she's trying to blind us with, you know, like, grow up, let's get serious, and let's, you know, try and save some lives. Uh, 
and also Katie Hope what, what are your thoughts about the solutions here? Well I guess it's people taking action you know there's been an outpouring of support for refugees and asylum seekers recently which has been really heartening to groups like ours um, right. people there want to do something and I would say there's lots of things you can do one of them is to do things like sign a parliamentary petition that tells your own government that you want to resettle more refugees there's one online at the moment that currently has just under 440,000 signatures go ahead and sign it okay. support your local refugee groups okay thanks very much both of you uh, time to sign off now for the Murdoch News at 7 our sister show Dialect Bristol's longest running podcast won't be here on BCFM next Tuesday sorry but the show has been pulled by the management thanks to our guest in the first hour Conservative Councillor for Hembury Chris Windows and freelance journalist Sam Downey thanks also to Alex Perry and Katie Hope you just heard there we're at thisweek.org.uk on the internet Please join us next week at five o'clock and don't let the banksters get you down. <laughs> From the Sky News Centre at seven, the health regulator monitors warned the National Health Service is under massive pressure and can no longer afford to go on as it is. Figures show NHS trusts in England have racked up a deficit approaching £1 billion in just three months. Inflated pay costs and an over-reliance on expensive agency staff are being blamed for the overspend. Howard Catton from the Royal College of Nursing warns it will have an impact. If they're stretched very thinly, if there are posts that have been left vacant, uh, then they may not be able to give as much time as they want to. And patients may see that it's taking a little bit longer for the nurse to come uh, or for them to get the care and treatment, and they may not have the time to talk to the nurse as much as they would like to. Health experts insist the risk to the general public is low as a nurse is readmitted to hospital in London with an unusual late complication from Ebola. Pauline Kafferke contracted the virus while working in Sierra Leone last year. The coroner at the inquest into the death of a mother who fell from a cliff with her newborn baby says opportunities were missed to help Charlotte Bevan. The bodies of the 30-year-old mother and her newborn daughter were found in the Avon Gorge two days after she disappeared from St Michael's Hospital in Bristol. She had a long history of mental illness. Dr Caroline Gamlin from NHS England South says improvements have already been made. As a health community, we will act on the coroner's findings to ensure that mothers with mental health needs and their babies have access to the services and professionals they need to keep them and their babies safe during pregnancy and following their birth. Detectives have recovered more of the stolen jewellery from the £20 million Hatton Garden raid. The development emerged at a bail hearing for one of the 13 defendants. Sam Allardyce has been confirmed as the new manager of Sunderland. He's been out of work since leaving West Ham at the end of last season. And England kick off in the next hour, aiming to make it nine wins out of nine in their Euro 2016 qualifying group. They face a Estonia at Wembley. Roy Hodgson's team have already reached next year's finals. That's the latest. I'm Kevin Gover.